guest here this evening. In the mid-1970s, uh, a young couple came from New Zealand to study here in London, uh, and that was myself and my wife at the time. Uh, I did my graduate work at King's down the road, and she came to SOAS uh, and was actually taught by Professor Cruz O'Brien. So there's a very, very long link, uh, both in my own personal terms, but also I think in terms of all of you here in this room, uh, with SOAS, uh, with the politics department. It's a department which has gone from strength to strength over the years. I was talking to the director of SOAS, Professor Paul Webley, uh, this afternoon, and he indicated just how pleased he is with the progress that the department has made. I think all of you will have been able to bear witness to that over the years. You will have seen how the department has changed, how it's progressed, but it's always kept its central ethos, and that is speaking truth and speaking truth to power. I'm going to introduce to you now tonight's chairman. Uh, he was the gentleman who, in fact, uh, played the key role in appointing me to SOAS more than a decade ago, so Dr. David Taylor. Well, Stephen, thank you very much for those uh, kind words of introduction. And besides being the dean of the faculty, Stephen is also a very distinguished and uh, uh, delightful colleague here in, in the department. So first of all, if I could add my welcome to everybody. There are many familiar faces uh, here in the audience, not everybody I, I actually know, but um, I hope to get to know some of you more later on. And the focus of this formal part of the evening is that uh, my five uh, colleagues on the panel are going to talk about their own work in the context of the departmental ethos that uh, uh, Professor Chan referred to, um, you know, how it's affected the way that they have approached key issues in uh, the contemporary world, and also how that has enabled them to, or them and colleagues, to contribute to the uh, distinctive uh, departmental approach to uh, the study of uh, politics and to the uh, discipline and discourse of political study more generally. When we began, I, I should say that uh, Donald Cruz O'Brien uh, predates me in the department. Uh, he joined in 1966, I joined in 1967. So uh, I'm delighted to cede uh, uh, preeminence to, to Donald. But the, in 1966 or 67, as Donald will remember, we were located in 24 uh, Woburn Square. Um, three of us to a room. Um, liner on the floors, and a notice on the wall that said, no more than five people in this room at any time, Camden Council. Um, but of course, in those days, there were not that number of students, so we didn't really have to worry about the um, load-bearing of the, of the timbers, but of course, that would be a very different matter today. Um, we moved subsequently to, uh, first of all, to the Phillips Building, and then, for the last few years, uh, to our <coughs> present home in the, uh, the college building, the old building. Thinking of the institutional development of the department, of course, the key event was in 1990, when the uh, erstwhile Department of Economic and Political Studies, which had come into existence on the 1st of January uh, 1962, just over 50 years ago, uh, was split into uh, two uh, separate departments. And Professor Howe, who's just come in, was uh, very much part of the uh, joint department in those days. But if I could just uh, cite uh, Terry Byers, who uh, wrote the um, official history of the um, school or contributed to the official history of the school, he referred, and it's not an unfair comment, to the barren union of economics and politics. <laughs> and after the uh, barren union had been dissolved, I think it's fair to say that both departments uh, have gone from strength to strength, not just in terms of size, although that's a major factor, but also in terms of the um, intellectual productivity and excitement that both departments have demonstrated. Another milestone, um, Bob Taylor is here and he was very much influential in its creation, the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy, which having been incubated in the womb of the Department of Politics is now uh, its own uh, separate entity and as uh, you know, doing extremely well. And then thirdly, uh, the reorganization of the school um, at the beginning of the 2000s into three faculties. And I have to say that uh, I was part of the decision-making process at that time. And uh, although perhaps faculties have uh, proved their worth in, in some respects, there was something that was lost at the same time. And in particular, what we lost was perhaps that sense of closeness that having uh, the departmental office meant. 
so that the work of, of colleagues like uh, Catherine Guest, who's here this evening, of uh, Brita Pouget, who's still uh, very happily uh, with us in the faculty office, and other uh, key figures who kept the department going uh, for year after year. So um, I do think that uh, that was a shame that that uh, reorganization did lose that sense of uh, departmental uh, cohesion. But the cohesion has been supplied in other ways, intellectually and through the students. I mentioned that in uh, 1966, all the students in the department could have been fitted into one small seminar room. Today, um, you couldn't get all the students in the department here into this lecture theater. Um, the first expansion was, in fact, on the undergraduate side in the 1980s when um, the department introduced undergraduate degrees for the first time, particularly joint degrees that have proved enormously uh, attractive. And then, a little bit later, the masters and PhD programs, which have been there from the beginning, began to expand very considerably, very rapidly indeed. And the diversity of offering also uh, increased, uh, particularly in the area of international uh, relations, uh, political economy, comparative politics, and so on. So that there was something for everybody who wanted to come to SARAS and study politics. And many of the people who've gone through the master's and PhD program have gone on to very distinguished academic careers <coughs> elsewhere. And I'm not going to be comprehensive, but I could just uh, single out uh, Fred Halliday, um, the, the late Fred Halliday, who was a very early student in the department, and Bill Brugger, um, who went on to be professor of politics in Australia, also sadly uh, no longer with us. And more recently, Ali Ansari, uh, a specialist on Iranian politics at uh, uh, St. Andrews, uh, Jane Duckett, another China specialist, Duncan McCargo um, at Leeds, uh, Paul Nugent at Edinburgh, an Africanist, uh, Mohammed Wasim, who went on to be Dean of the uh, Faculty of uh, Social Sciences at uh, Kaidi Azam University in Islamabad. And there are many others uh, who went on to senior professorial positions, having emerged out of the uh, training and the um, common purpose of the department. And Charles Tripp, I should not forget Charles, who uh, also <laughs> fits that, uh, that category. But undergraduates, um, of course, uh, also define what a department is about. The uh, undergraduate students here at SOAS, uh, diverse, enormously curious, interested, involved. Um, I'm not saying that students aren't that everywhere, but somehow there's a particular quality about a SOAS student that uh, you always recognize. And uh, that certainly has been the case with uh, SOAS undergraduate student body. Again, uh, just as you could fit uh, all the early students of the department into one room, so you could fit all the faculty members, all the academic staff into a very small room in those early days, just half a dozen, uh, seven or eight people perhaps in the 1960s. The founding fathers of the department I would look upon as uh, Professor Hugh Tinker, um, who joined the department from history, um, uh, Professor P.J. Vaticiotis, the Middle East specialist, um, and uh, Stuart Schramm, who happily is still with us, who joined a year or two later, but I think very much uh, gave uh, the department some of its early um, initial um, qualities and characteristics, the great specialist on um, political thought in China, particularly of Mao. And uh, there were more junior people in the department at that time. Sriram Merutra, my own supervisor, um, Donal, who joined in 66, Dennis Dalton, Abbas Kelidar, and others who um, have uh, uh, made careers uh, for themselves elsewhere. But you'll notice that of all the names I've mentioned so far, except I think for Jane, uh, there's not been a single woman. And it is true, and uh, one has to say it, that in those early stages, the department was, if not exclusively male, at least almost uh, exclusively male. And today, um, the department has changed uh, out of all recognition, um, so that uh, I think in gender terms, the department is approaching 50-50, uh, not quite there yet, but uh, rapidly approaching it. And it's also a very diverse department in terms of the um, national and ethnic background of, of colleagues. So that perhaps today's panel is a bit of a throwback to the past. Um, <laughs> and I, 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 I'm sorry about that. Um, we had hoped, we had hoped, that in fact, that there would be some other uh, colleagues joining us, but for various personal reasons, they weren't uh, <coughs> able to, uh, to make it uh, to London today. And also, to the extent that we're looking back towards the past, maybe that also partly accounts for it. 
but uh, anybody who's in the department at the moment will be well aware of the uh, diversity that it demonstrates. Now, we want to look a little bit at the academic focus, and it's uh, for that reason that uh, we've asked various colleagues to come and talk. But when I first joined the department, certainly, there was um, a very much an area studies focus, using that word in a not totally favourable uh, way, uh, an emphasis on understanding from the outside the history and peculiarities of the areas that we were uh, looking at. And I'm sure uh, that that has changed fundamentally, and I hope, sincerely hope that it has, that new areas of uh, inquiry have come into focus, political economy, international relations, in particular discourses on, on human rights and justice, political thought, which was there from the beginning, but I think has now been uh, informed by a completely new um, ethos deriving from uh, critical theory. And uh, um, there's a, I think, probably, if I think back to the early 60s, a greater openness to currents uh, elsewhere in political science and more generally in the social sciences. So that the department has evolved. I'm not sure that we've ever gone through a revolution, uh, but we've certainly uh, changed very considerably. And I hope that the speakers this evening will uh, show you something of that. What we're going to do, I've asked everybody to speak really just for a few minutes, five to seven minutes, and I'll try and uh, keep a watch on the time. And then there'll be, I hope, uh, plenty of time for people not just to ask questions, but to make comments and, and statements, although, again, I'll have to exercise a certain amount of discipline in terms of time. But I think this is an opportunity to, uh, for people to share you know, their impressions, their sense of what the department <coughs> is, has been in the past, and maybe will be in the future. Um, I'm going to, uh, first of all, invite uh, Professor Charles Tripp, uh, then uh, Dr. David Williams, uh, Dr. Mark Laffey and uh, Dr. Rochner Bajpai and Dr. Toby Dodge, so that's the uh, running order. Uh, most of you, of course, will, will know uh, the, the colleagues, so I won't spend any uh, time introducing them. So if I could first of all ask Charles, and we're going to speak from the table so that we won't have uh, too much getting up and sitting down. David, thank you very much. And, uh, You'll be glad to know that I won't go into the archaeology of my uh, career at SOAS, just to say I started as an MSc student in 1974, uh, and I'm still here. So there is a hope for you yet, or despair now, and you might as well uh, go away. But uh, I think one of the things that David said, which I think is important, is trying to get a sense of what was it that uh, not simply brought me here as an MSc student, but made me want to do my PhD here, and then eventually I did go away, uh, come back and apply for a job here. And I suppose there are two things that have been constant, despite the different ways in which they've been examined uh, in, over the years of my association with the department. One is the uh, emphasis on the discipline, that taking politics seriously, not simply as an activity in happens particular areas, but taking the study of politics seriously and thinking about <coughs> what you need in order to uh, make sense of that comparatively, theoretically grounding it in uh, an idea that this is a disciplinary area which needs uh, considerable attention. But the other aspect of it is why do politics at SOAS? Well, exactly because SOAS has a very strong sense of place. And I think in many senses, therefore, what you get at SOAS is precisely a notion of the depth of place, what you need to understand in order to understand particular places and uh, what goes on within them. So it was that combination of the two things, which may, of course, therefore, appeal to many who've joined uh, SOAS since. But I think... As far as I'm concerned, I think that that shaped up, I suppose, three main things in uh, what I got out of uh, learning at SOAS, but also eventually uh, joining the staff at SOAS, and clearly have shaped my own work as well, and was also part of uh, the department when I arrived, and therefore, in a sense, the intellectual interests of the people who taught me as well. One was the whole question of autocracy, explaining autocracy. In fact, my PhD thesis, its subtitle was... Uh, creating mass enthusiasm for autocracy. And in some senses, it was a puzzle. It was a puzzle because uh, at that stage, and certainly in writing since, as we've seen from other places, uh, very dominant personalities straddled the Middle East and straddled the study of the Middle East. Uh, my supervisor wrote particularly on Gamal Abdel Nasser, but there was also, of course, Khomeini, Saddam Hussein, Anwar Sadat, uh, Hafez al-Assad. These were 
people who didn't simply dominate the Middle East because they were wonderful people, but because they made themselves so. But of course, the interesting thing is, and this is where my work has come full circle, is that starting with the study of autocracy isn't just to study the person, uh, the uh, uh, necessary leader, as Saddam Hussein was called, but is to study the circumstances that allow that leadership to emerge. And so you could argue that from the beginning where I studied creating mass enthusiasm for autocracy, we come to the events preceding 2011 and 2011 <coughs> itself and watching autocracy unravel. In other words, where the strategies for uh, the enthusiastic adulation of the autocratic leader begin to dismantle, uh, are dismantled in one form or another, and a different kind of politics emerges. So one of the heartening things one could argue is that uh, watching that happen has been, in a sense, a lifetime's work. You watch how autocracy is put together, but then you see how people have subverted it and taken it apart. And so that informs my latest work, which is the book that's going to come out later in the year, on uh, the politics of resistance uh, in the Middle East itself and seeing how that's organized. But I think there's another two aspects to studying politics here, which has been very distinctive and certainly has influenced the way I've thought about it. One was something that I noticed very soon when I came was, you could say, the eclecticism of the theoretical grounding of the department. The notion that it wasn't just one orthodoxy, one view, one way of looking at the world. But I think that one thing that united many people in the department, and certainly has been an element since, quite refreshingly so, has been a, a strong suspicion of functionalism as a mode of explanation, whether of the left or of the right. Uh, and I, I would like to think that in some senses, I have tried to engage with that critically in my work on uh, Islam and capitalism trying to, in a sense, understand how the functionalist perspective has been so appealing for certain kinds of power, but also, in a sense, how deeply unsatisfactory it has been as a mode of social explanation, political explanation. So, again, one of the things that I think I got out of the range of the people who taught me, uh, but, of course, also the, uh, the works that they had written and the worlds they introduced me to, uh, was exactly this question that functionalism, in a sense, is a very circular form of explanation that needs to be taken apart. And therefore, in taking it apart, you open yourself up to <coughs> what I call effectively the eclecticism of theoretical grounding. And I think finally, uh, something that I've tried to deal with, and again, it's come full circle, which is something that I noticed really right at the beginning, and I think David alluded to it, was a strong emphasis on political thought, on how people think the political, and think the political in various ways, not just classical canons of political thought, but working at somewhere like SOAS where you had to think, how did people think of the political in very different kinds of situation? Uh, and in that sense, therefore, it meant getting to grips with notions of translation, which wasn't simply translation from one language to another, but one setting to another. And thinking about that creatively uh, has, again, I hope, been uh, part of the endeavor that's tried to inform my work. And I'm glad to see that also is coming full circle in a more productive way in the sense that my colleague uh, Rajna will be saying something about that. She and Matt Nelson, uh, another colleague in the department, are seeking at the moment to establish this uh, subfield or field of a discipline of political thought that hasn't been much uh, talked about or explored uh, of comparative political thought, getting some sense of what it means to compare political thought, not simply different uh, traditions of political thought, uh, but also the ways in which people act it out in different places and what, therefore, the meaning is, not simply as a textual or an elite production, but as uh, a popular form of action. So those, I suppose, are three areas which, in some form or another, have informed my work, but they're certainly something that I've got out of teaching at SOAS, but also, of course, by uh, the continued cooperation of uh, colleagues in the department. Thank you very much. And, uh... I could turn to David Williams, who did his PhD in the department a few years ago. I did. Thank you very much for asking me. Yes, I came in 1991, along with Toby, as master's students here, and then stayed on to a PhD and left in 1997. Um, so in some ways, it was lovely to be asked. And Toby and I have been reminiscing about SOAS for quite a long time, since, um, for a long time, actually, since we both left the department. I also confessed to a certain kind of anxiety about what exactly I was going to say today. Um, the first was I was reminded of something my supervisor said to me in a, one of our characteristic discussions about the state of British academia, that there was no space left anymore for the, what he called the bespoke book review, uh, you know, a kind of wonderfully polished engagement with a serious piece of work. And 
I kind of feel like this occasion requires a kind of equivalent of a sort of <coughs> bespoke book review. Um, but also, of course, with the way that modern academia is, with the NSS and the Research Excellence Framework and all of the other things we have to deal with, um, I haven't really had time to <laughs> produce the equivalent of the bespoke book review. The second reason I'm anxious is, is a kind of memories of SOAS seminars past. When I was a graduate student here, we went in kind of extremely fiercely. Anyone who came to talk to us, you know, had to be on their metal, otherwise they were going to be savaged by graduate students and indeed members of staff as well. So I, the thought of being presented with a room full of people who have that kind of attitude is also <laughs> slightly terrifying. <laughs> And the third reason is a kind of consciousness of a kind of reluctance to reflect, I suppose. Partly, it's the sort of thing you tend to do at the end of your career, not in the middle of it. Um, and I think one sort of one thing that came out of my thinking about it is a reluctance to think about the context of my own work at SOAS and indeed beyond. Partly because we don't like to think of our own work as being heavily informed by the context which we inhabit. And yes, of course, we know, as with all kind of academic thought, that it is kind of heavily contextual. Somehow we want to think of ourselves as, you know, a kind of individually inspired uh, when, of course, we're not. So what I thought I'd do is just say something about some of the contexts, if you like, which have helped inform my work and uh, that came to me kind of reflecting on my time here. The first one is obvious, which is, of course, the international context. Coming in 1991, um, the end of the Cold War, um, the first... or the war against Iraq after the invasion of Kuwait, um, the ending of Cold War rivalries in Africa in particular, the sort of so-called wave of democratization in Africa that happened in the 1990s. A sense, in other words, that things were changing and that there was a new kind of world to be explored and that some of the kind of older arguments that people characteristically had about politics in Africa or about the role of external powers in Africa somehow weren't any more appropriate for this kind of new circumstances. Um, and very specifically, as some of you may know for, about my own work, sort of two obvious points. One was that in the aftermath of the Cold War, Western states and Western agencies had a vastly expanded agenda in their relations with developing countries, particularly in Africa. So democracy, human rights, good governance, accountability, transparency, and so on and so forth. And, of course, there was also, or so it seemed to me, uh, a kind of increasing intrusiveness on the part of these Western states and agencies in these contexts, partly, of course, as a result of the end of the Cold War. As my, uh, I, a phrase my supervisor said to me, which I still use in my, to my students, there's only one game in town during the 1990s. And that, I think, sort of substantially informed the kinds of problems, if you like, um, that I was thinking about. The second thing I thought I would say something about is theory. Um, this is much more complicated, or at least it seems to me on reflection it was much more complicated. Part of it was associated with this kind of sense of newness, that older arguments about dependency theory or uh, certain kinds of uh, attempts to show the utility of kind of Marxist categories for thinking about politics or economy in developing states in a sense, weren't working anymore, or at least we wanted to do something new and interesting and more exciting, more innovative, I suppose. The trouble was, I think, in retrospect, that the obvious alternatives to these kind of strands of thought, forms of sort of liberal social science, particularly rational choice theory, or the kind of crudely teleological accounts or approaches to particularly Africa, why isn't there more democracy in why isn't there more civil society in, and so on and so forth, were all deemed, at least uh, by us at the time, I think, to be kind of obviously, theoretically kind of inadequate. Um, that theory, in some ways, certainly when I was a PhD student, was held in such high regard by ourselves and, I think, by others, um, that these kind of alternatives simply uh, kind of wouldn't work for us. And also, I think it's important to remember this is the context in the sense of American political science going through one of these kind of its kind of behaviorist, kind of empiricist high points, and we didn't want to do that, whatever it was that we actually um, did want to do. A third point is that uh, I think, for me anyway, and I think for, for, some of, uh, for some others of us, that what Western states and agencies were doing 
in this new kind of context couldn't be reduced to their e crude kind of economic or geostrategic interests. Uh, and that when the opportunity arose, as in after the end of the Cold War, or indeed during the period of colonialism, that these sort of states and agencies somehow transcended or at least kind of didn't, weren't driven by these kinds of crude interests and instead approached particularly African states, but I think other places as well, with a more kind of fundamental set of ideas about how politics, the economy, society should be constituted, and indeed about how, what it meant to, to kind of have a policy and what, it, what kind of relationships individuals ought to have with their polity and indeed with each other. So given this, it seems to me anyway, I said in retrospect, <laughs> it didn't seem like that at the time, of course, um, that it's no surprise that some of us at least tried to find a way to make sense of I suppose what we rather crudely call the role of these kinds of ideas in informing the way that Western states and Western development agencies kind of thought about uh, politics and the economy in, in developing countries. And, given, and so I suppose that also accounts for well, at least my uh, youthful enthusiasm for Foucault, um, but also others' interest in Gramsci, or indeed both. Um, uh, and I think that this kind of engagement, at least as I recall it, I don't quite know when it's really accurate, was kind of also situated in a kind of uh, an admiration of, or at least the, a recognition of the necessity of engaging with these broader questions of social theory that kind of dominate the social sciences about structure and agency, about identity, uh, about the role of ideology. And so now, needless to say, I make no claims to have resolved any of those kinds of questions, only that that thought that they ought to be engaged with in that kind of serious intellectual context, and it's certainly one that I took from my time here as a PhD student. The third thing, very briefly, I thought I would talk about is the sort of disciplines. Charles has alluded to it, and it's always struck me, certainly having left SOAS, that, that SOAS is a kind of slightly a sort of house divided in a sense. On the one hand, the disciplines, characteristic social science or humanities disciplines of history, sociology, economics and politics and so on, and area studies. And at best, of course, this is a very creative tension where we're forced always to think about the categories that are used in the disciplines in these particular contexts, although I think it also, at worst, is a kind of mutual incomprehension. Um, either way, that kind of division certainly kept all of us kind of grounded as you're always forced to think about what it meant in particular countries or particular regions. In terms of theory, I think that this kind of tension, if you like, within, so as this tension between the disciplines and, and kind of area studies, reinforced some of the things that I sort of mentioned earlier on, which is that some of the sort of characteristic categories, if you like, of Western political science, things I'm thinking here, particularly uh, things like civil society, democracy, the public space, even, as it were, the individual who at least kind of inhabits Western political theory, didn't really work. They didn't fit uh, what was actually happening. They didn't fit the reality in many of these kind of um, uh, countries. And, and, and the thought that these forms of theory were, in some senses, autobiographical, really, autobiographical, that is, of the West, rather than kind of analytical to be used in some kind of comparative politics. But the tension between sort of disciplines and area studies certainly created for me at any rate a, a kind of a tension I suppose partly because it seemed looking back on it anyway that the alternative to the sort of categories of Western political science was the kind of detailed empirical contextual uh, knowledge of particular countries or particular regions. And I think anyway for me in some senses that wasn't I wouldn't say it wasn't enough, but for various reasons, that wasn't kind of um, what I wanted to do. Um, and, and I think there was a slightly sort of paradoxical outcome, in some senses, for me at any rate, which was that rather than study the exotic other, I would actually study us instead, in a sense, study the West, study Western states, study Western development agencies in their relationships to and their attitudes towards um, others. Um, and that in this way, at least certain forms of generalization, certain kind of possibilities of, ca of kind of grasping something important, something general um, that was going on. The other thing I should say finally on that point, finally, finally, is that 
that kind of thing led me, if not exactly to embrace, certainly to inhabit international relations as a kind of subdiscipline of politics, something which didn't really exist here when I first arrived, love. So obviously, subsequently, it has um, grown a lot. Uh, <coughs> In some senses, the discipline of international relations helped me, at any rate, to not just find a home, but also to provide some answers to the tensions, or at least an escape from the tensions of the kind of comparative politics, uh, and some of the tensions between the disciplines, as it were, um, and area studies. Uh, you know, thinking all academic work is contextual, as I said at the beginning. Um, but I think my time here as a student taught me at least the importance of always trying to take seriously the values of academic practice while we recognize this kind of contextual and situatedness. And always to recognize, these are the two things I've always tried to take away from it, successful or not, I don't know, it's not for me to say, that there is always a need to know more, um, that is, we can't stop, um, and that in some sense there's always more thinking to do about the particular problems that you're interested in. I'm going to stop there, I think. I could ask uh, Mark Laffey. To have. Okay, um, thank you, David. Um, I have to say it's an honor and a privilege to be invited to speak this evening. Um, uh, I was gonna say something nice about David, but I think he just told me I was the past of the department. Uh, <laughs> and since I understood part of my responsibility was come along and talk about the arrival of what um, uh, has just been referred to as international relations in the department, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say nice things about you now, David. Um, <laughs> but I'm actually, I'm actually more concerned, really, about my, my senior colleague, Stephen Hopgood, who was the first international relations person in the department. So if I'm the past, I'm not quite sure what that says about his future <laughs> prospects. So um, if you want to, like, get together and sort of, like, help Steve sort of, like, cope with this moment, we'll be meeting outside <laughs> immediately afterwards. Um, so as I said, I'm going to say something about what it's like to be in international relations or what it has been like to be an international relations person at SOAS. I want to start by simply saying that when I applied for uh, a position at SOAS, I'd never heard of the institution. Um, now, admittedly, I had been to a party uh, in the old PhD student office. Um, and at that party, I met uh, Toby, uh, and I met Nick Hoschdittler, uh, who's uh, out here this evening, and I also met my former colleague, Catherine Dean. Um, but it was a party. Uh, and I'm pretty certain that if you'd asked me if I could find my way back to SOAS, um, I probably couldn't have done it. Because <laughs> uh, back in those days, um, I relied on my, my co-author and uh, colleague, uh, Tarek Bakawi, with whom I was staying at the time, I relied on him to sort of gu guide me around London because he had the local knowledge. Um, and he also had uh, a real ale guide, and so he knew where the good pubs were. <coughs> so anyway, um, after I accepted the post in 1999, uh, I went back to Akron, uh, which is the former rubber capital of the world, um, and in the dark post-industrial heart of Ohio, in the United States, uh, which was where I was then teaching. Uh, and suddenly, people that I'd never met or heard of or had anything to do with um, started coming up to me on campus and congratulating me on going to SOAS. That's great, congratulations, you're going to SOAS. <laughs> so even if I was not aware of SOAS, it rapidly became apparent to me that SOAS had this sort of like wider um, reputation uh, even in small town uh, Midwest America, which is where I was at the time. Now, my initial ignorance of where I was going to be working was not for lack of interest in the kinds of things that SOAS represents. So, I wrote my first paper on post-colonialism and international relations in 1992, um, and I presented it at the International Studies Association conference in Acapulco, in Mexico, uh, in 1993. Uh, and that paper was very nearly my first publication, uh, which would have meant that I sort of started out as a post-colonial international relations person, which I didn't. Um, the paper was solicited for uh, what went on to become a very prestigious volume, uh, one of the seminal texts of critical international relations. Uh, um, but it wasn't published because my co-author at the time, uh, Hemadeep Mupadi, uh, never finished his bit. Uh, and I was either too stubborn or, 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 or too stupid, or probably both, uh, to finish it myself. Um, uh, that was my first introduction to the, the joys and the frustrations of collaborative uh, writing. Um, now, I have to say that it's something I've continued to pursue. I, I, I really like the experience of thinking together, uh, which collaborative writing is about. And I think that's a kind of a nice way of thinking about what scholarship's about, because 
uh, I think scholarship is, in essence, always a collective and a, and a social process. Uh, and I certainly think that's true of, of my time at SOAS. So it wasn't that I was unaware of the, sort of the emerging recognition of the ways in which my field, international relations, had been and continues to be shaped by imperial power. Um, issues of imperialism and its implications for our concepts and our theories is a continuing theme in all of my research and writing, um, as my work on the democratic peace, uh, for example, which we're currently promoting uh, in the Middle East and pretty much everywhere else. My ignorance also did not stem from a lack of interest in interpretive social science, uh, or if you want to put that more simply, in people. Um, international relations <coughs> in the field, um, I think it's fair to say this, isn't particularly interested in people, um, or at least it's not really interested in most people. Um, now, it might pay attention to you if you're the leader of a government, say, uh, or if you're a foreign secretary, maybe. Um, but most people, most of the time, international relations just isn't interested. Now, from the start, my work had been part of sort of the broader critical and interpretive turn uh, in international relations. Um, while I was a PhD student, I helped to co-edit and contributed to a book called Cultures of Insecurity, which brought together, on the one hand, sort of cultural anthropologists, uh, and on the other, international relations scholars, political scientists, uh, to talk about the meaningful production uh, of insecure worlds. Now, that one actually got finished. Uh, so no matter how slow or difficult some of my contributors and co-authors turned out to be. So I understood the importance of sort of ethnographic uh, knowledge, what Charles invoked in terms of location, um, for making sense of the lived realities out of which international relations of diverse kinds uh, emerge and which they in turn shape. So why wasn't so as on my radar? I think the major reason stems from the fact, um, or from the nature, if you like, of political science, uh, and in particular international relations as a field, particularly in the United States, which is where I was trained. Uh, in her presidential address to the American Political Science Association uh, a few years ago, uh, Suzanne Huber Rudolph referred to the imperialism of categories. Reflecting on her field work in India uh, in the 1950s, uh, she discussed the ways in which political science as a discipline drew on and reinforced a set of sort of Eurocentric forms of knowledge. What she was doing, she was one of the first um, sort of behaviourally trained or behavioural oriented political scientists to go to India as an example of a, a new state coming into um, existence, coming to its own um, after, the Indi after the British left, kicked out. Um, and she was going with her husband uh, around villages and conducting survey research. Now, in the United States, when you conduct survey research, because people see themselves as, as individuals, um, they, they sit down and they discuss this with you. And it's kind of like a, an interaction between the, the political scientist on the one hand and the, the person on the other. What um, Susan Rudolph discovered going around these villages in India was that when she sat down with someone to get them to fill out the survey, the entire family would sit there. The household would sort of like do it collectively. And they'd discuss what the answers should be. Um, now, she might have just thought that the Indians were a bit confused about you know, whether they were individuals or not and what individual experience and privacy was about. But instead, she went back and she reflected upon the ways in which the categories that informed survey research, which is supposed to be kind of a, like a, a neutral way of um, <coughs> excavating people's um, views, values, and so forth, actually reflected a very particular context, which was that of um, North American social science. Now, that's political science, right? Now, international relations, which is sometimes also referred to as kind of an Anglo-American social science, is just like that with knobs on. Not only does it deploy categories which are derived from a certain quite partial account uh, of North Atlantic history, uh, it also assumes often quite explicitly an imperial perspective on the world, much as SOAS did uh, when it was first established as a school for the training of colonial administrators back at the start of the 20th century. In fact, you think about it like that, there's actually a natural fit between international relations on the one hand and so as on the other, uh, but so as, you know, circa 1925. So so as wasn't a reference point uh, for me because international relations, uh, in fact, even critical international relations uh, for the most part, just wasn't particularly interested uh, in imperialism. It wasn't really particularly interested in thinking about its relationship to these larger uh, imperial relations, colonial relations of power. And it also wasn't very interested in local knowledge or so-called local knowledge, uh, which was mostly seen, and is by many still seen, as mostly just kind of input, raw data, uh, for abstract theoretical models that are produced by North American uh, and North Atlantic political scientists. Anyway, David wanted me to do all of that and talk about revolutions. <laughs> so I'm now going to talk about revolutions for maybe a minute and a half. Yeah. Yeah. 
I've been invoking a kind of a, a revolution in international relations, one that sort of builds on critical theory and post-colonialism. Um, and also by implication, I've been sort of referring to or invoking uh, the nature of the study of politics uh, at SOAS. Now, a key source of those ideas, those ideas about critical theory and post-colonialism, was the anti-colonial struggles uh, of the post-1945 period, in particular what's sometimes referred to as the moment of the tricontinental uh, in Robert Young's terms. So the Chinese Revolution, for example, uh, which I'm now working on, uh, was integral to the, tri uh, to the, um, the tricontinental moment, as indeed was the Cuban Revolution uh, as well. Critical theory, too, has diverse sources, but it's inexplicable without the struggles for civil rights in the 50s and the 60s, uh, the opposition to the war uh, in Vietnam, uh, and the women's liberation movement. Uh, if you like, you could say that all of my work, and indeed sort of critical work more generally, post-colonial work uh, in political science and international relations, in one way or another draws on and seeks to extend the legacies in theory, in thought, of those revolutionary moments. In that sense, I think it contributes, I hope, uh, in a small way, to the continuing efforts over many years, by many scholars and students, to remake SOAS, not as an imperial institution, but as an anti-imperial and perhaps even as a post-imperial one. 